I'd like to welcome you all to our sofa chat. I have an incredible artist and human being on the show today, but before we get into it with him, please subscribe to the channel and click on the bell to receive the notifications. Being an underground hip hop artist is something we generally get into knowing that there is no guarantee of a career. We do this for the love and we carry on with a few perks thrown in every now and then. My next guest has done it all. From being one of the dopest producers and artists releasing numerous records, to writing books, to then switching things up and in current times being one of the dopest drummers that is now appearing in places that makes me feel slightly envious. But there's no envy here. His work weight is off the charts and he deserves the world of success. I can't wait to get into this one and I'm excited to have on the 521 Sofa Chat, the one, the only, the super talented Jay Zone. Welcome bro, how you feeling? I'm all right, man. Can't complain. Doing a little home renovation. So you caught me in the middle of a project. That's why it's echoing here. I haven't, I haven't moved. I haven't set my office up yet, but I got, I got my autograph cooling the gangs on the wall. So that's how you know. Oh, you're joking. About to start doing some business. <laughs> yeah, wicked. Well, look, if there's anyone that knows how to fix the sound issues, I'm sure you're the guy because you, you're the guy that can do pretty much almost everything. Yeah. <laughs> I hear you, man. You know, I heard about you probably in the late 90s. You know, I remember a time when me and you were constantly talking on the phone. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you were telling me what you were up to. And, you know, I was always blown away. I started introducing you to a lot of people. And I'm, I'm amazed that when I was introducing you, they were like, where have you been? We already know about him. <laughs> you know, so what, what do you want to tell us about the early days? Yeah, well, um, I actually started out as a funk bass player in the 80s. And um, that was my first love, but I couldn't find six other, six other guys to start a band with. So after like six years of playing bass and getting really good, I just decided to start making beats because I already had all the records that people were making beats out of. Everything that I heard on MTV raps or on any rap album, like I already had it because I was collecting records since I was young. So I started making beats in the, probably 92. And then I interned uh, in a few studios, uh, Power Play Studios in Queens. And I, I was there when Large Professor and Akinelli made the Vagina Diner album. I was an intern. So I was 15 years old. And when I saw Large Professor using SB1200, I wanted to get one myself. So I saved up, working a summer job, I got one. Started cutting demos at home. I, I started interning for Vance Wright, who was Slick Rick's DJ. Rick went to prison in 1990 or 91. And while Rick was in jail, Vance opened up a studio. So I was one of the neighborhood kids that would intern and run errands for people like Greg Nice and all these people that used to come by. Um, and then I eventually worked my way up in my senior year of high school and freshman year of college, I was the head engineer there. So that was actually my job, 95, 96. And then I realized that all these artists in the studio that we were producing and I was doing sessions for, yeah, we're going to take the demo downtown to Electro. We're going to take it to Def Jam or we're going to take it to, you know, take your pick. Uh, wow, pitch. I don't know. Anybody. And nothing would happen. And in the meantime, I'm listening to Stretch and Bobito and all these radio shows. I'm like, well, well these, they're, they're, this radio show, college radio, is playing these artists that are just pressing up a couple thousand copies on their own and doing it independently. And there's a store called Fat Beats and Bobito's Footwork. And they're selling them independent. Let's just do that. And the guys in the studio were a little older. So their mindset was, let's go get a deal. And I was young. I was the baby. And I was like, nah, we're not really making. Because at that time, Bad Boy ruled the charts. So it was a different kind of a sound. And it was like, you know, they had like a party sound. And I was like, if we're not going to make records like that, then let's go try to make you know, let's, let's try it an independent route and try to build something small. But they weren't really seeing that because they were from this 80s, early 90s mindset of trying to shop for a deal. And mm -hmm. that wasn't working. So I finished up college and my first, my senior project was my first album, uh, Music for Two Madre. That came out in 98 or 99, around that time before I graduated. And then, you know, that came out. And uh, I did it like the way I said I was going to do it, like in the studio. I was like, let's just press it and see. So I was working a couple of side jobs. I saved up a little money. I pressed it. And then it kind of took off small, but unexpectedly. And it didn't even have a real release date. It just I kept repressing it when they asked for it. I don't even know what the release date was, because that's how 
I didn't know what I was doing. I was just putting stuff out and it was candid. Like I was making mistakes along the way. I had no idea what I was doing. I was just doing it. I wanted to just be a producer. That's what I did when I was at Vance's studio. I was an engineer, producer, musician. That's always what I was. But because hip hop artists are unreliable, nobody would ever show up to the studio. And guys would be late. I, I have a thing. I feel bad because I kept you waiting 20 minutes because I ran into a problem. Like, I don't like when people are late. I don't like when people say they're going to be in the studio. They're not there. I was never a we, we, we were We were ready to pack up and leave. We were like, oh, you know what? Fuck, Jay. We're off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. But I was texting you saying, yo, I'll be there. I just got to. But I mean, um, you know, like, I, I never was like a big weed smoke. I was always like kind of square for lack of a better word. Like I'd always show, I was a nerd, I was into music. So I was like, let's show up on time and make some music. And I was like, all right, forget about it. Then I'm gonna just rap on this stuff myself. But I didn't really want to be an MC. I hated it, to be honest. I hated it. Like doing shows, I used to hate that. But they're like, if you're gonna release these records and you're gonna promote them, you have to promote them. Like you have to do shows. Like they, they're, your, your record's doing well, they want to know who you are. And I'm like, I'm just a cat who makes beats and wants to stay out of the way. And I don't want to be seen. I don't even want people to know what I look like. That's why I put my grandmother on the front of the album cover. Cause I was like, I don't want people to know remember that. what I look like. But I, I couldn't, that. you know, besides Al Sheed and Hug, the guys who were with me in the beginning, like I couldn't really depend on nobody else. So I had to start doing, I knew how to rhyme cause I would do it a little bit, but I wasn't serious, but I was, I wanted to just get this music out. And I said, if I get enough people into my records, then maybe I could just go off and be a producer like a Pete Rock does or like, a, you know, like an Alchemist does. Or... You know, you know what? I, I think all those people that let you down in the long run did you a massive favor. That's that's how I see it, because yeah, like the world discovered someone with multi talents like what you have. And we wouldn't have got to have seen that if you'd gone the normal route that everyone else goes. Yeah, yeah. And it was it was twofold because it, it got me out there, you know, but then I also because I, I was so disconnected from rapping, like being an MC that I created a character that was so far from who I was that I was like, nobody's going to believe this. And then people believed it. And that's where the problem started. Like, oh, he's a pimp. He's a, I'm like, man, I live, I take care of my grandmother. Like, I, how am I supposed to be a pimp? And I'm here taking care of a 90 year old, you know, so. People bought into the character, and that's when I was like, all right, I got to get out of here, man. Like, I made a couple of records. I, you know, I started releasing records yearly, and things were going well. But then around 2003, it started to become challenging because I got bored with the original sound I had, and they didn't really, a lot of people didn't like, people who liked the early stuff didn't like the direction I was going. And then, you know, I still worked with Al She, but, you know, the whole Old Made Billionaires thing, that fell apart. And I was basically stuck out there as a solo artist, the exact thing I didn't want to be. <laughs> I wanted to just do just enough to get these records done. And then now I'm a solo artist. So I kept going. I was doing an album a year till about 2004. And then after that, that's when you started having projects like Donuts and different things that were like instrumental records. And I was like, well, I'm a producer, so I'm going to do that. So that's when I started doing remix albums and um, that was that was the beauty of what you were doing. It's like you see, like when you watch a movie, you can you can accept an actor for switching into a role, playing that role, and then going back to live his normal life where he's not that character in the role. What is it that made you different in a way where people just saw you as that person and wouldn't accept that you were just playing a role? That's a good question, man. And what you said is absolutely right because to me, it's like okay, you know, uh, Sylvester Stallone can play Rocky or. Arnold Schwarzenegger, whatever, you know, like whatever, like people play the villain in the movie or they shoot up a million people and, and then they go home and be with their wife and kids. Like to me, it was like, OK, I mean, there were pieces of my personality in there. I had a really wild sense of humor. I was kind yeah. of a <laughs> like there were certain parts. But I mean, it was like. I also put out there, yeah, I live with my grandmother. I take care of my grandmother. It, it was the irony of it. I was thinking people ain't going to believe this. Like, they're going to know it's a joke and they're going to be in on a joke. And then when they started being for real about it, I started getting a lot of people who were degenerates who, like, really, like, related. And they would email me, yo, man. And I'm just like, and they would come up after shows. And I was just like, God, I hate this shit. <laughs> like, I got to a point where it was like maybe, 2005, it was just a job. 
I saw it as a job. Like you got to ask yourself, how many people walking around hate their job, but they go anyway because you got bills on the table. The average person doesn't like their job. So I think with the with the hip hop career, that's what happened. I became somebody who didn't like my job, but I created a career. So now mm-hmm. they like the off the wall humor. They like the fact that I'm outlandish. They like this comedic thing. They like these zany kind of circusy beats. And then it's like, okay, well, I got to do that to survive. Like at that point, it's like, this is my job. So I was emotionally detached. Art is different from a, not, a regular nine to five because like a regular nine to five, like you go in from nine to five, you turn off whatever you like and you just do your job and you go home. And then you can be yourself. Like with art, it's like, you try to get into character for a show, and when you get off stage, you return to your original self. But then you get off work, you don't get bothered with, with what you have to do at the job. Most people who hate their jobs, like, but when you have a career, it's twenty four seven. So you know, ever so rare, I wasn't famous, so I didn't get paparazzi. It wasn't like you know, I was I wasn't famous, but every so randomly, I would get approached in the street and yo man, Captain Backslap, and you know. I was just like, man, like, I just can't do this shit anymore. Um, And then after shows, like, you want to show people you're appreciative, but then you're like, damn, like, and it got to, I'm I'm not a drinker. I was never a drinker, but it got to the point where I would have to get, I would have to drink to do a show because I couldn't get into character being sober. I used to wear that big fur coat and all that stuff and do all that, like, towards the end. And I would, it would just be painful to do it. So, like, I had a series of like really low turnout shows and like some disastrous tours and shows like between 05 and 07, I had some really bad experiences on the road and I stopped. In 2007, I just stopped. Have you had any regrets? Nope. The best decision I ever made was to kill off my hip hop career. (laughs) Okay. But you you were basically telling me that, you know, you had all these opportunities. So you're in the studio with Lars Professor and people like that. And, um, you know, but things haven't really popped off, but you're hearing their names popping off and you know everyone's talking about them. And at some point, did you ever wonder why is no one talking about me? Why all them that I'm surrounded by, but not me? Why? Not, why early, not, not early on, like Large Professor, that was when I was 15. That started happening more in the, like when I was releasing albums. Cause you know, they have all these words like underrated and slept on and I, Give him his flat. The new one is flowers. We got to give you a flower. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not, that's not really my thing. Yeah. I just look at it as like, yo, I had my time. It ended. There was good times and bad times. And then I moved on. Like, I don't really look at it like, yo, you got to get your flowers. We, we got to go back to 2001. Like, I, I, I'm not that kind of an artist. Like, I just keep like, what's next? Like, I can't lament what happened or didn't happen. I have great memories from back then. I have lousy memories. That's yeah. life. That's anything. And then yeah. I just move forward. Like I, I'm not a very nostalgic person with my own art. And I think that I think that now that we're in an era where artists are accessible to the audience via social media, I think people now have the opportunity to tell artists like how much their art did for them. And yeah. that's great. But at the same time, if you don't feel like if you don't feel the same way about your own music that they feel about your music, then they get upset. And it's kind of like, you know, but it's their nostalgia. So it's almost like you're talking bad about my memories. You know what I mean? But it's like, to me, and it's like, well, it was my music, but it was your memories. And I, like, I'm super appreciative of people who, who like, I'm like, wow, they it made an impact and that makes me feel great. But then I, I'm not the type of person to do a 20 year anniversary of a record or, TBT or let's go back and revisit and do an introspective on yeah, this. Yeah, you move album. forward. Sorry, the person that I remember speaking to on the phone back in the days was always forward thinking. There you go. And that, and to me, that's what art is. And I'm a big Miles Davis fan. So obviously anybody who knows about Miles or, or read his book, like he went through hell, you know, every time he tried, he changed the face of jazz a whole bunch of times, but every time he did it, he got a handful, you know what I mean? Like going to the bitches brew, the electric era and making these changes. It's like the jazz purists weren't really feeling that. And, you know, it's like, I obviously I wasn't on that level, not even close, but it was like, I just always felt like the worst thing you want as an artist is boredom. 
you got to move forward, man. Because if you get yeah. bored, the crowd can tell. Like towards the end, I would do shows with my back to the crowd. I'd be cutting songs out of the set. Like you don't want to come off like that. People pay yeah. to see you. But at the same time, I can't perform a song I made eight years ago. And that's why I had such a hard time being a rap artist because people come to the show, they pay to see, they want the songs they can sing along to, and rightfully so. That's what fans do. I'm just never was that kind of artist. Like as a drummer, I'm able to do rights or whoever play out. Like we were able to play music from all our old albums because every show I can change it. As long as the melody is there and the basic groove, I can get, if I get bored, I can do stuff and people will still know, oh, he's performing Bug Juice, but he's doing this instead of that. And that's how I keep myself excited. And it's easier for me to do that as a drummer. But as a rap artist, if you do one of those songs and you do it over a different beat, they're like, huh? Or if you change yeah. the lyrics, huh? Yeah. You know, so yeah. it's like by the time, like I would release an album and when I, if the album had a big song that people like, like a year later, another album comes out, yo, we want you to do this. I don't want to do that. And then the crowd gets mad. They're supposed to get mad because they want to see you. But me as an artist, I'm like, I'm not doing that shit. <laughs> like that, I wrote that when I was 23. Now I'm 29. Like, bro. Have you ever had that situation where, you know, you all right, say, say you've got like three or four releases that you've already done. And yeah. then uh, you've got another project coming out and everyone's ignoring the project you got coming out, but they're all talking about your past. But oh, then okay. three years, but then three, this is, the, this is the punchline question now, right? But then three years later, you've got another project and the same project that you put out previously that they didn't like, now they're all calling that classic and saying that's Every amazing. Time. Every time. Because it has- I got it all the time. It has nothing to do with music. It has to do with nostalgia. You have, it's like wine. You have to give things a chance to get old. And in my experience, when things are no longer available, that's what people want them. So like when I made the switch into a full-time drummer, everybody said, yo, man, I miss your beats, I miss your raps. And I'm like, looking at the screen name, I'm like, well, I know that guy. Like when I put out Peter Pan Syndrome or Fish and Grits, my last albums, they were like, yo, man, you got to do Bottle of Whoop Ass again, man. And then it's like, yeah. now I'm like, I'm not even in hip hop anymore. And they're like, yo, man, you got to go back to Fish and Grits. I'm like, yeah, but when I did that, you were asking me to be what I was 20 years ago. And mm. so it's yeah. like, I learned that you can't let that get in your head. If you're an artist, you just got to do what you're going to do. You just, just got to yeah. look at your discography. You got to look at your discography like people are going to look at it when you're dead. Mm. And that's the trick. Like people only look at this album. Okay, next album got to do better than the like. If you're looking album to album, you got to step back and say, okay, let me look at my discography. In 60 years, when I'm dead and gone, like how are they going to look at this discography? That's why I'm not afraid to experiment and make an album that isn't that great because it's going to tell a story. And you could read, you could tell my story by looking at my discography. You know, the, the very, the last two hip hop albums I made were Peter Pan Syndrome in 2013 and Fish and Grits in 2016. Those two albums are half instrumentals with me just doing drum solos and half rap songs. And when you listen to the rap songs, they're all one verse. Most of 90% of them are one verse because I just didn't want to be rapping, but I knew people If I did an album full of freaking drum solos, nobody would care. So <laughs> I knew I had to rap, but after I wrote one verse, I'm like, ah, do this shit. So I'm going to the booth and That's... cut up the verse. And because I knew that I had to ease them in. And I was like transitioning from one world into the other. So those two albums, if you look at them, they're half drum, funk, instrumental bass, and they're half hip hop albums and this is something the public wouldn't know but all the beats on there were beats that I had made in 2006, 7, 8 at the end of my right before I stopped that I never used and I just pulled all those beats back up took out all the sample drums and played drums on top of them so I wasn't even making new beats I was using leftover beats and adding live drums when, when you look at it that way you know what I mean like they were rap albums but they were transitional. You could see I was on my way out. So like now that you know that, when you look at, when I'm dead and gone, you look at my discography, you can see that I stopped in two, like 2005, six, I stopped rapping. Then I did a bunch of instrumental and remix liquor store album and all that stuff. So sick, like you could tell that I didn't want to be a rapper and I was doing anything I could to be creative without being Jay Zone, the rapper. And then you could tell after 2008, I quit. 
Then I come back five years later, I'm rapping again, but it's like more focused on instrumentals, drumming, funk. I'm releasing drum break albums on the side of these albums. So you can look at my discography and gradually see, okay, he's still a hip hop artist, but he's doing this. It's tapering down. I wasn't doing any shows. So it's tapering. And then all of a sudden in 2016, Fishing Grits, the last album comes out. Every rhyme on there is about how I don't want to be a rapper anymore. <laughs> and I can't stand rap, rapping and shit. My grandmother died, half the album's instrumental. And then six months later, the do rights comes out. And then all of a sudden, I'm gone. So yeah, like, yeah. but if you look at my whole discography from 1998 to 2021, you can see the story, right? But if I was trying to please both audiences, I would, you know, you can't think album to album. You just got to kind of think about, you don't want to repeat yourself. And, and yeah. you have to be willing to make an album that might not be that great in order to not repeat yourself. And yeah. that's the way that I see it. Uh, even now, when I told people that I'm going to be talking to you for an interview, people are like, seriously, J-Zone, oh my God. So you've got your name cemented in the underground scene in a way that can't be easily erased. You did a lot of things, you know, but we, you know, I don't want to dwell on the whole hip hop side of things because those are memories for me and like for many people, it's nostalgia and all that kind of stuff. But you moved on to do a load of other things. Um, yeah. Namely, you wrote a book in, I think it was 2011. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, the book. So basically, like I said, I stopped performing in 2007. And 2008 was my last release, which was Chief Chinchilla Live at the Liquor Store. And that's me with my voice altered, rap, doing St. Ives commercials. It's like an album full of malt liquor commercials. I was so bored with my Jay's own career. I was like, let me create an alter ego and do a malt liquors jingle album, one minute each. And it was like 30 tracks or something. And people, it came out and people were like, what the hell is this shit? And, you know, after that, I remember it being 2009 and I just turned 32 and I hadn't made a beat since I did that liquor store album. And I just had a bunch of side jobs. Like I was a sports reporter covering high school sports. I was, uh, I was teaching at my college. I went back to be a music teacher. So I had that. And I just had other jobs and I was like, I need to get away from music because I was so burnt out. Like it got to the point, like if somebody, like if I even heard, like one of those old songs or somebody brought it up, I would just cringe like, ah, but you don't want to be an asshole to people who appreciate you. I'm like, yo, thanks, no doubt. But inside I'm like, oh, I can't say that shit. So- You have to be an artist to understand that feeling, isn't it? Yeah, you have to be an artist to understand. <laughs> yo, pimps don't pay taxes. Oh, I hate that, right? <laughs> you know, so it's like, you know, it, it got to the point where like 2009, 10, I didn't even want to hear about that. So I totally disconnected everything, shut it all down. I remember I, sh I, I closed the, 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 land, the phone, the telephone line for the business. I took all the money out of the accounts. I had two floods in my basement. So the studio kind of got messed up. I sold most of my record collection. I just got rid of a lot see, of see that See that flood that messed up your studio. That was more than likely a sign from God telling you you need to move the sign. Not only that, it was two floods two years in a row. One and Wait, two, there you go. There's two signs because you missed the first one. The first, yeah, the first. Well, the first one I was already done, but the second one totally pulled up the floor. I had like parquet floors in my studio, like nice wood floors, and it buckled the wood. And I said, "That's it." And I turned my basement into just like a lounge, got rid of the stuff, and I just was working regular jobs. I was, um, I worked in a school system. Uh, mm -hmm. I worked in a high school. And my boss, my supervisor was Rakim, seventh grade math teacher. His name was Mr. Berger. Hold and on, Rakim, Rakim. Yes, because Rakim- Are you serious? Wow. So, <laughs> Rakim is from a place called Wine Dance, Long Island. And so is Groovy Chill. If anybody remembers the group Groovy Chill. Um, and, and, and Rakim and Sid and Beaton. There was a couple of groups that were from Wine Dance, but it's a small cluster. In Long, on Long Island, and I knew a lot of people who worked there from covering basketball, and my man Oxygen had connections in the district. I was like, look, I just want to get a regular job and get away from this music, this rap shit completely. Mm. And they got me a job in the district, and Mr. Berger, he had been in the district for like 40 years. He mm. just actually just retired, and 
he began as a math teacher, and one of his first students was William Griffin, Rakim. And Rakim, so geez. I always joke with him, like, yo, how did you did you teach him how to put seven MCs in a line? <laughs> like I'm joking, <laughs> you know, like, and um, I'm working there support operations, which is like free lunch people who didn't have money, getting them school supplies, superintendent hearings, like when there would be fights and they had to do discipline, like I would be the stenographer in the hearing. Like, so this was my job. It was called support operations. And I was just, I just wanted to have a job. And I was like, maybe I could work my way up in the district and get like a full-time position, but it was like a temp job. And I was doing that. And I used to hear these kids walking around the school talking about, yeah, I'm gonna be a rapper, man. I wanna be famous. I'm going to have girls and cars and get money. I'm going to be the next little Wayne. And I'm like, these kids have no idea. Yeah. That shit ain't nothing like that. And I'm thinking, like, I'm bitter as hell about my rap career. It's just, I, I ain't going to lie. Can I be real on the show or I got to Yeah, be yeah. Bro, I want you to be honest. Okay, you want me to be honest? I couldn't fucking stand any of my music. I couldn't stand that shit. Like to hear that, like the only thing I liked, my man Al Sheed. Like Al Sheed is one of the greatest freaking rap artists I ever worked with. So I could always listen to Al Sheed and be like, oh yeah, but anything with me rapping, any old Captain Backslap, yo, they hated it. Hated that shit. Like I hated it, hated it, hated it, hated it, hated it. Hated it. And, it's, and it wasn't so much like, oh, you didn't get rich, or you didn't get famous, or you didn't get your flowers. Or this. It wasn't so much that. I just looked at it as like, I don't really like what I was doing. And, and it just like, I listened to the music and I was just like, it doesn't do anything for me. And then it brought back a lot of bad memories, especially towards the end of dealing with the business side, you know, just de de being the character. I was like, I was this character and I, I knew I was angry at myself because I knew that this wasn't really what I wanted to do, but I did it anyway. Oh, shit! <laughs> the blind <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, this is live, so we're going to keep it live. I knew all along that, like, man, you shouldn't be doing this. Like, your heart's not in it, but I did it anyway. So I was, like, mad at myself. And that's something that people don't really understand, especially when they love something and you don't feel the same way. So I kept a lot of those feelings to myself. I didn't really talk about it. And it started to eat me up. Like I started to get real, real bitter about the rap career. And between that, hearing these kids walking around school saying they're gonna be millionaires off of rap and it ain't like that. And one more thing happened. I was working in the office. I get a call from Fat Beats. The distributor, the record label. Yeah, yeah. Like, like uh, listen, man, like you have all these albums they haven't sold. You have like thousands of copies of like all these albums here sitting in your warehouse. We're getting returned, they're not selling, there's no room. What do you want to do? Do you want to come get them? I didn't even think about it. I said, burn them. I was like, give me 10 of each and burn the rest. When you were where I was mentally, you just didn't want, you just wanted to forget about it. And that's something that, um, like I said, that's something you gotta be an artist to understand. It's not about money. It's not about, yo, these people loved it. It's about like you being true to yourself. So I, they said, well, you gotta come to the warehouse and sign the paperwork. You just can't burn this. Like you gotta come down here to do it. So I left the school, 3.30, the bell rang. I left the school, drove all the way from Wine Dance to Brooklyn, which is probably about 50 miles. Went up to the warehouse right before they closed, traffic and everything, got there at six on the nose. Signed it off, took 10 of each, left, and had no regrets about it. Um, and then I get home that night and my grandmother was still alive. She was living with me. I get a notice from my grandmother. Uh, certified mail, which means that you have to like, she signed for it, like meaning it's important. It's not junk mail. So I open it. My digital distributor who put music on iTunes and like back then that was new. Like we're talking about 2010. So iTunes was still new. Like you had to have some clout to get your music on iTunes. Mm. They dropped me. They were like, yo, your stuff's not selling. We want to discontinue this agreement. You have to send this agreement back to us via certified mail 
so we can remove all your stuff from iTunes. And I was like, they never called me to tell me they were going to do this. This had, this came out of left field. Like this was out of nowhere, you know? So all this is going on at once. And I just said, you know what? I'm going to write a book because I, I would like when I stopped making music, one thing I did do was I would write. I used to write for Ego Trip and I used to write for Dante Ross, who had a blog. Dante Ross was a famous hip hop A&R at Electra Records and Tommy Boy, who signed De La Soul, P. Rock, Seal Smooth, Old Dirty Bastard, KMD, Leaders in the New School, all that. Um, so I was writing for Dante and people liked my writing. But then even when I got the job at the school, I stopped doing that. I said, well, I do like to write. I was like, if I don't get all this out of my system, I'm going to go nuts. So I started working on my book. I would work at the school from eight to four. Then I would go cover a high school basketball game after work, one at 4.30, one at seven. I would get home at 9.30, 10 o'clock. I would write up the articles for the game while I was eating dinner take me about an hour and a half. And from 1130 to midnight every day, I would write a half hour, go to sleep. And I did that for the rest of the school year. And um, that's how I wrote that book. And I wanted the book. So what, what was the book called? Root for the, Root for the Villain, Rap, Bullshit, and the Celebration of Failure. Yeah, that's, that sums it up, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I so wanted, how, did that, how did that book do for you? Book did great. Book did great. Um, I wasn't expecting nothing. I was doing it for my own mental health to, 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 to get that off my chest. And, to, and for people who really, there's been books about artists who are famous, but most artists don't become famous. What happens to them? That's a story. You know what I mean? That's a story that's worth telling. And I tried, I had a friend of mine was a literary agent. She tried to shop it to a few publishers and they didn't want it because I wasn't famous. So I said, okay, I'm gonna do this myself. And you know, I had I was I saved up some money from the job and some other things, and I self-published it through Amazon. I pressed up 300 copies, not knowing what was gonna happen. And out of nowhere, it took off. I wasn't expecting that. Um, and the book did really well, and then all of a sudden Quest Love is tweeting about it. I'm getting write-ups in the AV Club and the LA Times and Spin Magazine and you know, and all of a sudden, people are like checking for me. <laughs> and they hadn't checked for me in seven years. They thought I died or something. Like, I just disappeared. You know, and then all of a sudden, there's this renewed interest in who Jay's own is. Then all of a sudden, digital distributors started reaching out. Hey, why isn't your stuff on iTunes? Because they dropped me. Well, come with us. Because the book came out. Yo, we, when are you going to do another album? I don't want to do another album. You know, and it was like, you should do another album. I'm like, I don't want to get back into music just because you're interested in my music because of the book. You know what I mean? So it was kind of like one of those things where, I, but I was like, you know what? I do need to get back to music, but I'm going to do it different this time. And I remember driving home from work, from the school every day, I was listening to, a, I went back to my funk and jazz roots that I was into as a kid. So I, I didn't listen to no rap in the car. I would only listen to like Billy Cobham, you know, Miles, yeah. Cool in the Gang, like the Meters, Ohio Players, Slave, Brass Construction, BT Express. Who's, who's your favorite drummer? It's actually Funky George Brown from Cool in the Gang, the most sampled okay. drummer. Okay, amazing. <laughs> and Clyde Stubblefield, the most sampled drummers ever. Yo, Clyde Stubblefield had to be there, isn't it? Joe Duke's a great jazz funk drummer. You know, Idris Muhammad, Mitch Mitchell, Jack Dijonette, Elvin Jones. I mean, there's tons of them. But this is the stuff I was listening to in the car. And I was like, how crazy would it be if I learned to play drums? Like, not professionally, but what if I learned to play just to stop being... Because the book was a success, but I was still bitter about music. Like, I didn't want to hear shit about music. I just... Yeah. Was, the book is just... Now I wrote the book. I got that off my chest. Now let me go on with my life. And, you know, it looked like the school thing wasn't going nowhere. This basketball thing definitely wasn't going nowhere. And, you know, I was playing drums as a hobby. I got, you know, my dad got me a little cheap set when he came to visit. He surprised me. And I just went downstairs and started playing. And after about six months, I was like, I had turned 35. I was like, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? <laughs> like, what are you going to like? 
hang around and keep blogging, writing articles or doing odd jobs or are you going to go back to doing hip hop? Are you going to DJ? Like, what are you going to do? Like, you got to, even if you fail, you got to really sink your teeth into something. You can't just be doing a little of this, a little of that. And I was like, well, you're sitting up here playing drums six hours a day. You know, like I was working odd jobs at night. My grandmother had dementia. So I'm here taking care of my grandmother during the day. And when she was in bed, I would go downstairs and beat up on the drums for like four or five, six hours every single day. And I'm like, well, when you started playing bass as a kid, that's what you did. When you got your SP-1200 in 92, started making beats, that's what you did. When you were writing your book, that's what you did. So it's like you're already doing everything in your life that had any kind of value whatsoever. That's how you started. What you're doing now, why not play the drums? And I'm like, but yeah, nobody's going to take me seriously. Like this comedic rap artist becomes a drummer. Like, how is that? Like, nobody's going to believe that. But then I was like, don't even think about it that way. Just think about it as you know who you are before there was a J-Zone. You know what you're about. You know what your pedigree in music is. You know what kind of discipline you have. You have to be happy. So I would say in March or April of 2012, six hours a day, every single day for like the next year. And then before I knew it, I started getting a little better. And um, I started recording myself with the little janky equipment I had. And I realized that I was the, the drums. I had a lot to learn as a drummer, but the recordings themselves, I'm like, that sounds like an old record that I would have sampled. When I was making beats, I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing, but it doesn't sound like a clean, modern thing. It sounds like an old drum, beat up old 70s funk record. I'm like, I'm, I had the sound before I had the chops. Like, I had the sound. And I was like, I could be on to something. So then I just said, let me pull up some of these old beats that I never used and play drums on them. Take the sample drums out and play drums on top. And then I started playing drums on top, I'm like, the beat sounds better with me playing on it than it did with the program drums or the drum loop that I had. Yeah. And then I just kind of started casually making beats again, but I wasn't really out digging for records or really into production, like, but I was more focused on the drum side. And then all of a sudden I had a bunch of beats with like live drums on them. And I was like, well, what if I take the stories in my book and what I've been going through in life and just write a quick song about each one, see what happens. So I did Peter Pan syndrome, which was quote unquote comeback album. And it can, and I released it and it was well received. People were happy to see me back, but it wasn't like how it was in the beginning. Like, I think people knew that it was, it was a, it was a moral victory. It's like, you know, he overcame all that stuff in the book. He got over that bitterness. He found this new thing. He's back to music. This is great. But it wasn't like, I remember a booking agent in Europe actually told somebody who asked me, I said, yo, they were like, well, should I ask this booking agent about bringing you out on tour? I was like, I don't really want to rap, but if you want to ask her, ask the booking agent. And she's like, yeah, people are happy that he's back, but don't get it twisted. Nobody's going to pay to see him. That's what the booking agent said. This is 2013. Uh, and I was real, though, isn't it? But it's real. And it's yeah. real. And I was like, you know what? I can't be mad at that. They're happy to see me come out of how dismal I was with the book and like be back to music, doing it for myself. That was a moral victory, but it wasn't a sustainable career. Mm -hmm. And but the response to the drums on Peter Pan syndrome, people are like, yo, I want to sample the drums on that song, but you don't leave them open nowhere. And then sometimes I would leave them open and they would use them. And they'd be like, yo, I used the drums off your rap album. And then I was like, what so if I... How did, how did you manage to get the passion back? Because that's, you know, once you get to that point where you've lost oh, the passion, it's drums. hard. It was drums. I didn't care about rapping. I but, didn't care but, about drums. But what I'm saying is it's like, you know, something must have triggered to make you realize, you know, this is, this is making me feel like getting back into it now. So before the drums, what was it that, or was it just a case that you got the drums, you might as well mess around, and then the passion just naturally built? That's exactly it. I didn't know what to expect. I got the drums just to like, my father was like, yo, you've been bitter for a real long time. Like, you're a musician. I know you don't want to rap. You don't want to make beats. So you, you, weren't, you, weren't one of, you weren't one of these guys that got bitter, got yourself armed with a couple of Uzis, went to schools and started shooting everybody. No, it was like... It didn't get that bad. No, it wasn't that bad. 
But, okay. It, but it was. It was <laughs> but you know, you know what? From your early rap career, with all the characters you've done, I'm surprised you haven't done that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so it was just like he, he. You know, he he was right. He was like. I've been a musician. I've been into music since I was five. Like it didn't feel, I mean, writing a book was great, but it didn't feel right not doing something musical. But I still did, don't, even though the book made me less bitter, it didn't make me want to be a rap artist again. I only did that because it was a vehicle for the drums. You know what I'm saying? Like, and when people heard the drumming on the rap album, producers who were into my stuff started saying, yo, I want your drums. And I was like, for real? So then I got hooked up with the drum broker and I released a drum break record of like 35 drum breaks called Lunch Breaks in 2014. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, Jake won, Alchemist, Marco Polo, they were all sampling it. And I'm like, what? And they were like, yo, Zone has these drum records out, they're legit. And then all of a sudden, people started calling me. Marco Polo was one of the first. He was like, yo, let I'll pay you to do a whole library for me. Word? So then now I'm making money doing drums. So I started doing that 2013, 2014, 2015. Like I'm getting deeper into that lane. And in the meantime, 2013, 14, I put out a post on Facebook. I was like, look, I've been playing in my basement. I've been doing break beats but I want to start playing with other people because that's what being a musician is about. It's about playing with other musicians. And that's, that's the beauty of making music. Like you can be and, by and yourself showing off. And you, and, and you have a, you have a kind of victory as well in another sense, the fact that you didn't want to be in the forefront on stage, um, sort of as the main guy that everyone's yes. watching. So now you're working in the background, unless people read the credits, they don't realize you're the guy that's on the drums. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so you felt good about that? Yeah, I felt great about that. So I put this up on Facebook, like, hey, does any musicians in New York want to come over to my basement and jam? Like, I want to see if I can play with other people. Like, I want to see if I'm good yet or not. The only person to respond to that post was Pablo Mar Martin, who is my partner in the do rights. He was, uh, he was in another group before, wasn't he? Well, he was in the top. Um, Right, because I remember reading the name somewhere before, but I couldn't, I couldn't place where. Well, he read it there because he was in a Tom Tom Pop, and he was the mastering engineer on all my rap albums. Oh, wow. So that's probably where I've seen his name I've before. I've known Pablo since 2000. When I first did Bottle of Whoop Ass, he was the mastering engineer. So he was my mastering guy. Yeah. But I didn't know he was an instrumentalist. I didn't know he was a musician. I just knew he was an engineer. But he was touring with Tom Tom Club, and he was my mastering engineer, but I didn't know he was a guitar and bass player. And he was like, I'll bring my bass over, and we'll jam. So he came over, we jammed, and he was like, yo, how long have you been playing? I'm like, I've been playing about a year. He's like, yo, you're freaking good for a year. And I was like, yeah, because I've been playing six hours a day. And he's like, let's just start working on some funk. Me and you. And we started working on do right stuff back in 2013. That's how far mm -hmm. I moved back. And in the process, I had a couple of other things going on. I had a, a super group that I was a part of. You know, um, that didn't work out. I did one more rap album, which was Fishing Grits. It was half instrumental, half rapping. And what was rapping. that, 2015? Yeah, I was doing a lot of 45s, like seven inches with a rap song on one side and a funk instrumental with drum breaks on the other side. Trying, I was like kind of getting people warmed up for what was going to happen. So I was like gradually phasing out. You know, like when you go to a store and they're about to, they're about to go out of business, the, all the stuff is half price. Yeah. yeah, That's what was happening with the rap. Like you're going to get a Jay's own 45, but it's only half rap. <laughs> you're going to get a Jay's own <laughs> album, but it's only half rap. So everything was half price. Like it was a clearance sale. Like I'm getting rid of any verses I had, all beats I had. I'm putting live drums on them and putting them on the album. Like it wasn't like in the beginning where I was like, oh, I'm an artist, I'm a producer. Like it was like, I'm ending this chapter of my career. Um, and I'm waiting until I get good enough as a drummer before I do it. <laughs> and I phased it out, Fishy Grits. My grandmother passed while the album was in production. And the last thing she said to me is like, are you happy? And I was like, I could be happy. I'm happy, but I could be happier. And that made me think like, 
you need to just start over. Like you need to go into a whole new field and close the door permanently. It's like a relationship that doesn't end and you keep holding out hope, hanging around. Like eventually you got to cut the cord. And the hip hop thing is like, you're not passionate about it. It doesn't pay a whole lot of money. Why are you doing it? And it's like, instead of doing half rap, half instrumental records, like put all your time into the funk band. When you were eight years old, you wanted to start a funk band, but you couldn't find seven other guys to do it. Now with the technology, I play keys, I play drums, and I play bass. Pablo plays keys and bass and guitar. We got a, out, we got a band right there between the two of us. It's like, this is your funk band. This is what you dreamed about in fifth grade. It's here. It just took 30 years to get here. I kept releasing break records, and then I dedicated myself fully to drumming. So when I did, you know, like when I did that, I started getting better. And the break record started getting better. And people started noticing me. And I, I devoted my Instagram to that. The band and the drumming, nothing else. And um, what happened was there's a DJ named Louie Lou. He was King Sun's DJ. There was an all vinyl event in Manhattan, New York City called Mobile Mondays. Mm-hmm. And every, every Monday you go there and play 45s. All the DJs would play 40, 45s only. And Louie Lou had two copies of one of my breakbeat records called uh, Backyard Breaks. And Louie Lou was cutting up two copies of it. And the label, like in the middle of a 45, you have like a label. Yep. And on the label, I did like a fake mock-up of the old Brunswick Records label. I don't know how many people know Brunswick. Yeah, it's, yeah. Like black, it's like a black label with a, like a red a color rainbow, a triangular yeah, yeah. rainbow. So I did like a, 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 a homage to um, Brunswick. And Lord Finesse apparently was like, yo, this drums on a Brunswick record? I don't have that. So he's at the turntables like, what is that? What is that? I don't have that. You got two copies. It's a Brunswick record with because Brunswick records are great, but none of them really have drums. And Lord Finesse yeah. is like, what is that? And Louie Lou is like, yo, it's Jay Zone. He's like, no, I know who Jay Zone is. He's the rapper. I, who, what's that record you were playing? Yeah, and he's yeah. like, no, it is Jay Zone. Jay Zone. And he's yeah. like, he's a drummer? He's like, yeah, he's a drummer. <laughs> and Lord Finesse got my number through Marco Polo and he called me. He was like, yo, man, I need that record. <laughs> I was like, okay. So I went to his house. I, I just got on the train and went to his house and I bought him two copies. And he's like, yo, I'm gonna use you on something. Hold tight, be patient. He's like, I'm gonna, I got something for you. I got some work for you. I was like, okay. And you're thinking like, okay, cool, that's cool. Yeah, whatever, whatever. Man, like he calls me like a year or two later. And he's like, look, I got access to all of the reels from like Motown. I could get any Motown song I want. I'm gonna, and Motown commissioned me to remix all of these, remix some songs. Temptations, Jackson Five, uh, Switch, Elder Barge. Yeah. I mean, like Clyde, Michael Jackson, the classic stuff. And he was like, "There's one song I want you to redo all the drums, play live all the way through." And it was a song called uh, "Now Is the Time," which was on the soundtrack for the movie The Mac. Mm-hmm. And it's a it's a sister's love song that Willie Hutch arranged. And I always loved the song. But he's like, I want you to redo the drums. And when he got the go-ahead, I redid the drums. And I played drums on, um, that's, uh, the, the thing is called, well, I have it here, actually. The Motown State of Mind. Um, oh, brilliant. So it's a box set, 45. Um, so I, I played drums on Now Is The Time. And um, that's how that began. And then just recently, I did a whole album for Showbiz. Because oh, he brilliant. heard the Lord wow. Finesse thing and it's DITC. Yeah. So I started doing stuff for showbiz. And then early on, Danger Mouse was using me for stuff. So I did like Broken Bells and Karen O, Michael Kiwanuka. Like, so Danger Mouse and I go way back to the Lex Records days in the early 2000s. We used to tour together. We were friends. Me and Danger Mouse are homeboys. So when he <laughs> went into doing, he stopped, he went more into doing bands like the Gorillas and Gnarls Barkley and, you know, yeah. nor, you know, all that stuff, Nora Jones. And then when he saw that I was playing, doing the drum thing, 
he was one of the first people to reach out. He's like, yeah, that's really cool. You're doing drums. And then we reconnected as musicians. We started out as beat makers and then we reconnected as composers and musicians. So Lord, so Danger Mouse was already there. Marco Polo was already there. Lord Finesse came around. Showbiz came around. I did something for Alchemist. Um, I did something for DJ Newmark. I did something for like Farrell Monch. Uh, oh. <laughs> then I get a phone call in October that Mad Lib sampled my drums for his new record with Fortet. Um, and he used the first drum break record I made, Lunch Breaks, back in 2013, 14. And I had only been playing drums for two years at that point. So if like Mad Lib is sampling me drumming at two at the two year mark, then you know, it made me fully realize that um, I, I made the right choice. So now, you know, I wound up doing stuff with Mad Lib. I was just like, I was in shock. I was like, is this really happening? You know, like these are guys who were my peers as like hip hop producers and artists. And now I'm working for them as a session player. Like you never would have told me that that, that was going to be my life at yeah. some point. But I was like, I was just so happy. Like I hadn't been happy in almost 20 years. So, so I'm going to gonna ask you what your grandmother asked you. Uh -huh. Are you happy now? Absolutely. Yeah. That's all I wanted to do when I was a kid. I just look back to like when I was 10 years old and I was like, what did I want to do? And I would get these funk records, you know, I get the, I'll pull one out, but I, you know, you, like you see the ones on the wall, you get like a cool in the gang records and you know, yeah. you look on the inside and you see the guys with the fros and the funky outfits playing their instruments. And I was like, that's what I want to do. And then, you know, I had no idea that I would like discover hip hop because it was more feasible for me to do. And I would have a whole career and then I would end up back there. So, you know, to end up where I initially wanted to go is the thing that keeps me grounded. Like I always say, think about, when you get bitter, or you get discouraged, think about why you started in the first place. That's what, that's, that's, that's something that I lost sight of as a hip hop artist. Cause hip hop, it was like, I just wanted to be this mad scientist making beats, doing albums, you know, like how Prince Paul and DJ Pooh would do those crazy skits. Like I used to love putting the album together, but when it was time to do a show, I would want to run the other way. <laughs> so it's like, but, it, but they come together. You can't just put out, these, now people want to see you live. So now you got to, that's the other part of it. So I said, keep in touch with what you wanted to start. And I was like, I wanted to be the guy on the album cover playing his instrument, but I also wanted to be the guy on the stage in the back playing the bass or holding down the drums. I'm not the star of the show, but I'm keeping the groove. And I eventually became a touring drummer. This was 2019. I'm thankful I got to experience that before the pandemic hit, because yeah. if it didn't happen then, I would have never got. I mean, I've played in nightclubs. I've played in I've done festivals, I've done, but 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 to play for 2000 people and you're the man holding down the beat and then they give you a four bar break and you're thundering through it and you hear the crowd clap like that was something for somebody who hated performing live. Yeah. That's such a that's such a relieving feeling to be on stage and to really want to be up there. Like, yo, I'm up here and I'm loving every minute of this shit. You worked with Jest as well in the UK. Uh, I, I was on my first tour with Jazz T. OK. And, um, we came over to the UK for the first time. I actually met Mad Lib for the first time. It was at Scala in London. And, OK, um, yeah. I met Mad Lib and Peanut Butter Wolf there for the first time. So it's ironic that I wound up working with Mad Lib 20 years later as a drummer is crazy. But, you know, we went on the tour and me and Harry used to, Harry called me up when my first album came out and the number was on the back back then. And we used to trade beat tapes through the mail and talk music on the phone. And who's, who's this, Harry Love? Harry Love, yeah. So like, I was like, all right, well, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I, I'm, I got nothing. So I went and stayed at his house, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then we recorded then. And I just hung out with him and his family. And, you know, we were young. Like I was like, what, 23? I mean, I was a baby, you know, yeah. and, I, and when we hung out, that's when we recorded that, you know, yeah. and then um, I guess it came out later on. Um, but yeah, that was when I was over there. Is there anything that you want to promote? Well, yeah. Uh, well, the do rights a funky bad time. I don't know if you can see it up on the wall, but it's the one that looks yeah, like yeah. Chick Corea looking cover. 
Um, we're working on our six, which is going to be an EP now, a 10 inch. So we're, we're recording that now, and I'm, I'm doing some some uh, some library music for a, not- a very notable producer. I'm going to keep the lid on, who, but that's coming. I've been doing okay. a lot of session work. Um, I was going to ask you, are you still producing? No, I haven't made a beat in six years. I'm glad it's over. I'm glad I had great times while I did it, no regret, but it's it, it's time to move on, man. So yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, there's, there's no going back. And you got to burn a bridge. Steve Arrington, the great Steve Arrington, once told me, yeah. like, sometimes you got to, you can't be afraid to burn a bridge. It's scary, but when you can't go back, you're forced to look forward. I'm not going to say it was a mistake. It was a natural progression. But the last two rap albums I did in 2013 and 16, Peter Pan Syndrome and Fish and Grits, it was a man who knew where I, I knew where I wanted to go, but I wasn't quite ready to leave the safety net of what I built as Jay's own. Even though in my mind it was all over, I was like, well, there's still people who might support it. The artist doesn't owe the fan the nostalgia to the, a chance to relive their nostalgia. And the fan doesn't owe the artist lifetime support. It's, exactly. it's, it's quid pro quo. You, you, you support the records you like. And as an artist, you make what you like because life is too short. And it's 2021. What are you going to do? Get dropped from your label? Make the music you want to make and then let let the public decide if they want to get with it and and you keep moving forward. And that's always been my attitude as an artist. My attitude as an artist never changed. It's just that the music itself changed. Why Jay Zone? That came from, well, my name is Jared, but Jay Zone came from high school. I used to have a Walkman 24-7 in class never took it off mm-hmm. and and they it was glued to my head. even the teachers gave up they were like well he's paying attention he's just got his walkman on and i'd be walking through the halls like not paying attention to people and they'd be like yo jay you're always in a zone man jay you're always in a zone so then it just was like jay's zone. that's where it came from do you know rakeem personally no never met him. <laughs> oh, i was gonna ask you if you could hook us up <laughs> no nah, I, ne- I never i know his math teacher but i don't know him I never, I never hey, maybe, maybe we could do an interview with the math teacher. He's just retired. I'm trying to track down his cell phone because he's not in his office anymore. I got to find Mr. B. Shout out to Mr. Okay. Berger, man. Love that guy. That's one of my heroes, man. Steve Berger. We don't even realize that there's people that we went to school with that have done amazing things. So we're all in some way connected to someone who's done some amazing things. We've mm-hmm. gone on to do amazing things. And you just don't know who's in the background bubbling away with something incredible, you know? You never just know. I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> But you know what, um, bro, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us here. Um, I hope everything just keeps going from strength to strength for yourself. And, um, you know, I, I hope the world gets to see more of your talent because it's a ridiculous amount of talent. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Look, Jay Zone is one of the most talented artists I know and is an incredible character with it too. If you don't know about him, you need to go and find out. Go and follow him on his connection pages and find out more for yourself. You're not going to regret that. All the relevant links can be found in the description below. Comment, like, share, and make sure you subscribe to the channel and click the bell to receive the notifications. Until next time, stay safe, be lucky, and see you soon. Thanks for watching.